God, thank you for hearing the prayer of our heart to truly just open up our heart and open up our life to you and allow you to work in our life to the degree that through our life you are glorified. God, we're here today for no other reason than to worship you. And we lift up your name today above every name. God, thank you for calling us to put everything else aside, everything else from our life aside, and have no other gods before you. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, the author of your word, who draws us to communion with you, who draws us to worship you. So God, today I pray that as as your word speaks to our heart, we will open up our lives and, and with all the integrity of our heart, all the integrity of our life, just say, God, we go away from here today. We, we want you to be glorified in us. We want you to be the Lord of our life. We want to worship you, not just with our words, with our total life. In Jesus' name now, we continue to worship. Amen. I invite you to open your Bible again with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're, we're working our way between now and Easter uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. And we've come to Matthew chapter 5 up to this point in our worship services this year. We've laid the foundation with Jesus as he has preached this message. And by the way, this, this message is the launch pad for the total ministry of Jesus. The next three years after he preaches this message, he's going to be living out every single detail of this message. And so we join today and pick up from last week with Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin reading with verse 21. Read the next 21 verses. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gifts. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was said also, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, I say, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. 
Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the word of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, if you back up one verse, you get the launch pad for our scripture text for today. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus said that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So how can we be more righteous than scribes and Pharisees? How can we be more righteous than these men, we talked about this last week, who meticulously copied every single word of Scripture? They knew the law. How how could we be more righteous than the Pharisees who literally memorized all of these laws that were contained in God's Word? In fact, they served as the judicial system. For their day, they called out people who would break one of these laws, these 613 laws that had been established by the time Jesus came to the earth. Well, last week, we discovered that we can't. We can't be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. Unfortunately, The scribes and Pharisees couldn't stand righteous before God either. Their motive for managing the law of God was to look good. They wanted people who looked at them to think that they were knowing the law and keeping the law. Their motive in managing the law was to look good. And so Jesus called them out. Jesus recognized the tragic flaw in their method of living and managing the law. They knew about God. They knew about the rules and regulations. But their heart was far from God. In fact, they didn't even know God. So self-righteousness always falls short when we place it alongside the righteousness of God. And that's why the scribes and Pharisees couldn't keep the law of God. Nor can you, nor can I. So what is the message God is trying to give us through this text? In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, the Bible clearly says that man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? God looks at the heart. God looks at the motives behind the actions that you and I take. Now, don't take this scripture wrong. Outward appearance is important because outward appearance is how other people see. I mean, that's why I remember Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 16, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. So outward appearances are important, but they're not the primary point of importance. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so your actions must demonstrate what God's heart looks like. Your actions must look like what God looks like. So for today, I want us to examine our hearts. What is our motive for how we act? And even more importantly than that, how we react. Four times in these 21 verses, Jesus will compare what you have heard to what he says. And there could not be a more relevant message to your life and my life than today. See, for the scribes and Pharisees, the heart of the problem was a problem of their heart. So how is your heart today? How do you stand, not in how you look to other people, but how you truly are in your relationship with God and your heart? Are you willing today to join me and let Jesus evaluate your heart and look into your heart? I had a friend once who was a pretty good guy. Uh, 
He made some mistakes once in a while, but overall he was, he was an okay kind of guy. And he knew and told everybody that he was not a bad person. He fudged a little bit on his income tax, according to his story, but not really cheated. He just said he fudged a little bit. Uh, he would sneak out occasionally on Friday nights away from the family and go out on the town. Not, not often, but occasionally he would do that. Uh, at his work as a used car salesman, he said he didn't lie. I mean, he occasionally would just stretch the truth a little bit about some vehicles, but he wouldn't actually lie to people. One day he sat in a church service like this, and he was challenged to look into God's spiritual mirror. He came away from that service, and he joined a little small group that we had. We were studying through a little book called The Man in the Mirror. And in that process... He began to study God's Word. And the more and more he studied God's Word, the more and more God's light began to shine into his life and literally burn a hole in his heart. The more it burned, the more and more he realized how much he needed Jesus. And guess what? I do too. I need Jesus as well because I can't stand before God in righteousness on my own accord. I can't be good enough to stand before God as righteous. The scribes and Pharisees needed more than their good works, needed more than appearing to live by the law according to the law. Their best was not enough. My best is not enough. Your best is not enough. Our best will never change the motive of our heart. <clears throat> so Jesus invites us today to check our hearts. We're going to check our hearts in three areas according to this scripture passage. So look at it again with me as we walk back through this passage and check our hearts in at least three different areas. First of all, our hearts need to be checked at the value of human life. The value of human life. In verses 21 again through 26, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. Now, the judgment that he's talking about here, that Jesus talked about here, is the human court. The human court. I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. Again, the human court. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. I think he was referring here to what was called the Sanhedrin. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. This is talking about God's judgment, God's justice. Now understand what Jesus is saying here and what he is not saying here. Murder, according to the sixth commandment, is condemned by God. Exodus 20, 13 clearly says, you shall not murder. And the law condemns the murderers, who, those who murder, to death. The Bible says in Exodus 21, 12 and Leviticus 24, 17, the penalty for murder is death. So again, the Bible is so clear about valuing all human life. So Jesus is not saying that inappropriate anger and insulting comments are worse than murder. But here's what you and I need to hear, just like those who sat on that hillside that day and listened to Jesus preach this sermon needed to hear. When you express anger in an inappropriate way or you make insulting remarks about another human being, you bring judgment upon yourself. Humans, all humans, are formed in the image of God. And we respect all human life because we respect God and His image. We're all formed in the image of God. An inappropriate expression of anger defiles our spirit, which should be devoted to God. We love what God loves. We hate what God hates. 
God loves human life. And so inappropriate expression of anger leads to violence, and violence does not honor human life. So why did God make the law in the first place? Well, God made the law because He values human life. He made the law to give us boundaries, to give us standards, a parenthesis to live our life between so that we, like Him, can value human life. And angry words and name-calling, those kinds of things just reveal a heart that is far from God, that is opposite from the loving heart of God toward human life that he created in his own image, by the way, that he highly values. Now, we need to understand that, you know, some anger, and we're not going to go way down this road today, but some anger is appropriate anger. Jesus expressed anger. Anger is an emotion that God gives us. And oftentimes, when we become angry, we become angry at the same kinds of things that God becomes angry at. And that's good. That's a good thing, to be angry at what God is angry at. But how we express that anger should not become damaging to us either, even if it's appropriate anger. In other words, never live in your anger because living in even appropriate anger, but especially living in inappropriate anger, devalues human life. It blocks our heart relationship with God, and we don't want to have anything blocking our relationship with God. In fact, that's what sin in general does. It opens the door. Inappropriate anger or living in our anger more than expressing it like God expresses it opens the door for us to devalue human life. And so Jesus continues in this narrative to drill deeper in his sermon. He goes deeper than that. In verse 23, he says, If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember, your brother has something against you. In other words, you have violated somebody else. You've caused somebody else to hold a grudge or resentment against you. Remember that your brother has something against you. Verse 24, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you put be, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. Now, there's, a, there's some cultural issues going on here, but I think we can understand the point. Jesus encourages every human being as the highest priority in life to worship God. Worship is at the very nature of Drilled into your life, born into your life by God. You are drawn as a created being of God to worship Him. But Jesus said worship as a matter of the heart is, is insufficient and blocked when you have inappropriate anger in your heart or allow somebody else to have inappropriate anger toward you. When you know you have offended someone, as far as is is within you, the Bible says, you go to that person and you make that right so you won't be dragged into the civil court and the name of God be defiled. Before you worship, make that matter right as far as it's concerned with you. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, the Bible says to obey is better than to sacrifice. And this is a principle here. If someone has something against you, you go make that thing right with them, and then you open up your life to worshiping God. Because any form of anger or resentment does what? It devalues human life. It kills your heart for worshiping God. Just showing up at an event like this is not worship unless your heart is aligned with the heart of God and your worship 
is not blocked or hindered by a sin that you've committed or by a resentment that someone else is holding against you when you have the opportunity to make that thing right. So value in life is a priority alongside of worship of God. Where does value in life begin? Well, value in life begins by you knowing Jesus. You can't value life like God values life without knowing Jesus. Without coming to Him, admitting that you've sinned against God, understanding that Jesus Christ gave His life. He came and lived in the flesh as a human being to give His life to sacrifice for your sin so that you can be free from sin. That's important to understand as we move through this message of Jesus. He is the key, the gate, the bridge to setting you free from your sin so that you can worship God, so that you can be convicted by the Holy Spirit to make things right with people when they have an offense against you. The scribes and Pharisees knew the law, but they missed the creator of the law. And consequently, they miss knowing God. And I pray that not one person will go away from here today without a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at how to do that as we move through the rest of this sermon. See, the Bible says blessings and curses do not flow from the same mouth, the same stream in the book of James. If somebody has something against you and you know it, make it right so your heart can be free to worship God. Knowing Jesus is a heart issue. The same Jesus who called religious people out for putting anger ahead of their relationship with God may be checking your heart today. And if there's a relationship that you have that is not in alignment as far as it's concerned with you, with you confessing whatever you have done to offend them so that they can forgive you, and that's all you can do is take that to them and ask them to forgive you. And when you do that, it opens up the door for you to complete your worship process with God. I pray that we'll let the message of Jesus penetrate our life today because God values human life and anything that stands between us valuing another human life is blocking our worship with God. We can't let that happen. Secondly, We need to value human relationships. And again, all three of these are going to go hand in glove with each other. It's really just a kind of a one-point sermon today. But I want to challenge us to check our heart with the value of human relationships. In verse 27, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that the whole body is thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, because it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. Now here again, Jesus is highlighting the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Where does all sin begin? Are you aware that all sin begins in the heart? It's a heart problem. It's a heart issue. Especially sexual sin. Jesus, Jesus used this drastic example to remind us that our thoughts lead to motives. And our motives lead to temptation. And when we fall to temptation... We fall into sin. We fall into disaster. We separate ourselves from God. 
And again, Jesus used this drastic example for cutting out sin. When he talks about tearing your eye out and throwing it away or cutting your arm off and throwing it away, he's not being literal here. He's saying that sin is serious and whatever we need to do to get rid of sin, we need to, we need to get rid of it. Take drastic action to get rid of sin, but especially sexual sin. So Jesus uses for the second time here a phrase that I want us to understand. He's very familiar with the area of Jerusalem known as the Valley of Hinnon or Gehenna, translated here hell. It was where in ancient times Israelites were lured into sacrificing children to their pagan god. Now here was the principle. It was their form of abortion. It was their form of putting their personal pleasure, their personal comfort ahead of life. And remember, we've already said God values all human life. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 3, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 35, Israel was being lured away by the worship of Moloch, which was a search for pleasure, a search for comfort, and they were sacrificing their own children to a God that didn't even exist. They were putting their own personal preference, their own personal pleasure over human life. And so Josiah comes along and he turns this area into a constantly burning trash dump. If if you go to Israel today, that's what this area is. It's a burning trash dump, a perpetually burning trash dump. So what was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying that hell is a place where those who devalue life, their life, and the lives of others, will spend eternity. Lust. Adultery. Sexual sin of any kind devalues human life. So inappropriate sexual thoughts and actions, again, go back to the heart. It's a matter of of the heart. Lust is serious. Adultery is serious because it's sin and it blocks our relationship with God. It devalues human life. So a couple of suggestions here and... Areas of awareness that we need to be aware of, how lust kind of sneaks into our hearts and sneaks into our lives today. First of all, we we do need to learn to guard our eyes. I mean, I don't think Jesus used this pluck your eye out kind of example just haphazardly. We need to guard our eyes. It's no surprise that Jesus used this exaggerated principle here. Pluck it out. Pornography is one of the major industries in our culture today. People use pornography to sell just about everything, to advertise just about everything. Statistics show, and by the way, pornography is any visual image that arouses you sexually. It destroys the mind. It destroys marriages. It destroys lives. Statistics show that 70% of men between ages 18 and 24 watch pornography. One out of every three pornography viewers are women. The average age of a child to first view pornography is 11. Now let that sink in. When married men view pornography, the divorce rate doubles. When married women view pornography, the divorce rate triples. 
So be aware of the power of the visual image and flee from it, run from it. Now, I want to be really clear here. There's, there's a difference in seeing pornography and looking at pornography. Uh, with the culture that we live in today, riding down the road with billboards and, I mean, magazines and just, I mean, everybody is going to be exposed to pornography. I mean, there's, there's no way not to see it. But you can't avoid looking at it. By looking at it, I mean, you, you let it run through your mind. You, you see something... And you walk away from it, then you look back at it again. And then you're captured again and again and again and again. You go back and look and look and look and look. So learn to immediately look away and learn to immediately not look back when a sexually explicit image flashes before your face. I want to challenge you to spend much time praying to value God with your eyes because you can't value God and devalue human life by dwelling on pornography. Guard your mind by valuing God and others above the fallen natural desire that you have in the flesh. Parents, I want to encourage you too as well that our youth director, Luis Sanchez, regularly leads a workshop on how to block pornography from social media and other internet kind of access opportunities. You need to create circles of accountability in your life to, to expose to other people or another person, if you're a man, another man, if you're a woman, another woman, that when you're, you're tempted, you, you call that person and ask that person to pray for you and to help you. Uh, there, are, there are processes. I know one of our staff members in the past had uh, a system called Covenant Eyes that any time he was looking at his computer and something uh, that, that was going south came up, it, he, it, a, text, a message came to me and I was able to call him and talk with him about that. There are ways to avoid being drowned in pornography. But you have to make the effort to not let it rule your life. Value human life is the principle with your sexual thoughts and actions. I've said this before, let me say it again. Every industry under the sun uses sex to advertise so be aware that lust and sexual sin destroy human dignity and destroy human relationship. Ray Ortland wrote a book entitled The Death of Porn. And I would recommend that book. I read through it this past weekend. I would recommend that book. The subtitle is Men of Integrity Building a, a World of Nobility. Satan is powerful, but the truth of God and the Word of God is more powerful. And when you draw circles of accountability around your life, you can win the victory along with many who have in the past in this arena. Jesus goes on and says in verse 31 then, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Marriage is a lifetime covenant between one man and one woman in the eyes of God. It's holy. It's sacred. We honor the marriage covenant because we honor God. Now Jesus was talking to a generation of religious leaders here who referred to a passage in the Mosaic Law where it created ways to look religious while creating ways to get around God's plan to honor human life. 
many of these 613 laws that the the, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees had pulled from the original Ten Commandments of God were cultural kinds of activities, cultural kinds of laws. But again, let me say this. In God's eyes, marriage is a lifetime covenant. And Jesus came along and Jesus set a new standard for marriage. Marriage is a picture of the relationship to Christ and His church. And the standard is to value your relationship with God by valuing the marriage relationship. Commitment to marriage creates security for each other in marriage. It creates stability for children in the family. And it strengthens lives of those who interact with the family and allows us to weather the stresses of life in a positive way. Marriage is hard work. Hard work. Now this may not be your story, but I just want to take a minute and share a snippet from my marriage. Gail and I have been married for 47 years. 47 and a half years. Between years five and seven, we kind of hit a brick wall. We came to a crossroads in our marriage. I was pastoring a little church up in the northwestern part of this state. She was in school. For months, as we worked through that troubled time, we drove to another city in our state once a week for several months. And a pastor took us through a counseling process. We had to decide whether we wanted to honor God or honor our selfish feelings. And by the grace of God, our, our marriage survived, obviously. Here's what we learned. We learned that we had to put Jesus Christ in the center of our life. And then the closer each of us as individuals drew to Jesus, the closer we drew to one another. And that's what saved our marriage. Our commitment and devotion to Jesus saved our marriage. By the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, we give all glory and praise to Jesus for being where we are today. Jesus is all about forgiveness. That's the principle in the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. Finding ways to forgive and to reconcile and to restore broken relationship is at the heart of God with every sin. See if I can put it this way. We, we've had a few struggles with uh, water in our house in the last two years. Um, our washing machine overflowed a couple of years ago, and the water covered all of our floors. We had to replace 2,000 feet of hardwood on our floors. We didn't tear down the whole house. We, we just replaced the floors. Last year, when, when Hurricane Ian came through, Shingles blew off of our house, and we had to have a whole new roof system put on our house. We didn't tear down the whole house. We just fixed the part that was damaged. Came home from work at lunch one day, and the city truck was out in front of our house. The water line had broken. Uh, Fortunately, it was on the street side of the meter. (laughs) He didn't replace the whole water system in the town. He just fixed the part that was, you know, damaged in front of our house. And on and on and on, I could go. The point is, when you have struggles in your marriage, make sure you deal with the the, the area that's causing the struggle and get that fixed, and then the marriage can continue to thrive. Marriage is sacred. And here's the point Jesus is making here. Never use divorce laws in order to get rid of one spouse so you can get another spouse. That's the issue here. When the house has been 
torn down, though, by abuse or by infidelity or by abandonment. Jesus is in the rebuilding business. Jesus can build you a new house. If you're divorced, remember, God loves you. If your sin caused the divorce, ask God to forgive you and then put him in the highest place in your life and move on glorifying him with your life. If you're divorced today and you're remarried, remember, God loves you. You are a beautiful opportunity for God's love to shine through your life. Continue to put him in the highest place in your life and honor him with that high position in your life. And let him get glory through whatever your state is in marriage or remarriage. The point here is check your heart and make sure that you are valuing human relationship to the highest degree. And finally this morning as we conclude, there's another area to check your heart. And that's the value of human integrity. Again, you've heard it said in verse 33, it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So here Jesus exposed religious leaders who had created a way again to break an oath and still appear not to break God's law. They were looking on the outside. Their scheme was to swear by the earth or by Jerusalem or by their own head, but not go so far as to swear by the name of God. And then under pressure of maybe financial loss or some other kinds of stress, their reputation would not be tainted. They were self-righteous. They were hypocrites. And the principle here, Jesus is encouraging us just to be honest When we make a commitment, keep it. You become a reflection of the light of Jesus when you stand by your word and honor your word. Especially when it costs you. You become salt to the earth when you stand by your word. Again, especially when it costs you something. Very quickly, three months ago, Gail and I were on the way to a football game and Hartsville, and we pulled in front of the Daytona 500 Speedway and stopped at a traffic light. We were dead still, and all of a sudden this car crashed into the back of our vehicle. I jumped out, I pulled over to the side of the road, he pulled over to the side of the road, I jumped out, I ran back. I said, man, what were you doing? He said, well, I dropped my cell phone down between the seat and I was reaching over to pick it up. I said, well, you have insurance, I'm sure. He stopped and paused, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh. He said, well, I have SR-22 insurance. SR-22 is when you've lost your insurance because of a DUI or whatever, and you're paying an ungodly amount of money to get it back, and if you break the law while driving law while you're under SR-22 insurance, you, you, you lose your insurance again, and you may even go to jail. So long story short, I made a quick decision, took pictures of his license and all of that, and said, you know, he said, I promise, man, I'm going to pay. I promise, I'm, I'm going to pay for this. I'm going to pay for you. I'm going to pay for your car. Five or six times, he said, I promise, I'm going to pay. So I get back in the car, drive off. Gail said, he's not going to pay. And I said, that's probably true, but we'll see. So I've stayed in touch with him over the last several months, and... This past week, I was reading through this passage, so I sent him a text message. I said, hey, man, I'm praying for you. Give me a call. Just want to talk to you. He texted me back, and he said, man, I'm having the roughest time of my life. He said, but I start to work on Monday. I'm going to pay my debt. <laughs> and I said, man, I tell you what, I, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. My goal, and I could care less about the money. My goal is I want to see Quentin come to Jesus. 
I want to see him come to know the same Lord I know. So when I make a promise, I keep that promise. So when he makes a promise, in the future he'll keep that promise. It's about, it's about his soul. So when believers make a commitment, they keep that commitment. And I make a commitment, you know, I want to see this man come to know Jesus, and I want to keep that commitment. But when a believer makes a commitment, we keep that commitment. So the light of Jesus, remember the whole, the whole, the big picture, so the light of Jesus can shine through our actions, and so, so the Lord can be glorified. When you and I stand in the righteousness of Jesus, there's no need for us to lie. There's no need for us to say, you know, I promise in God's name or in the name of Myrtle Beach or in the name of Jerusalem. (laughs) There's no need for false pretense. So we'll continue this next week, but how, how do we kind of pull the frame around each of our lives today? And I want us to really hear this. How's your heart? What is the motive behind your actions? I pray that the motive behind our actions is to know Jesus and walk with him so that when people look at us, They see the light of Jesus shining from our life. Are you willing today to lay your heart open before Jesus? See, nothing in life matters more than how I daily give my heart to Jesus. Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So how is your heart? To be righteous is to be broken. You understand that? Have you ever come before God and said, I need help, I'm guilty, I'm not righteous, I'm a sinner? So come before Jesus secondly with open hands. Not in your self-righteousness, but in His righteousness. And thirdly, remember, God loves sinners. And that's you. That's me. That's everyone who will come to him who understands that we need his righteousness and ask to stand before God in his righteousness. Human life, human relationships, human integrity, all are matters of the heart. I want to close this morning by looking at a scripture passage in 1 John because I think it puts all of this in perspective. 1 John chapter 1. We all got excited yesterday when that balloon got shot out of the sky, didn't we? If you hadn't heard of it, where have you been? Under a rock? I mean, I felt it. It jarred my house. I'm sure you felt it as well. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's not except any sin. (laughs) Divorce, remarriage, pornography, Alcoholism, drug addiction. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And then in verse 9, two verses down, he says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now I know this has been It's been a longer message than usual. But the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And if you have a sin to confess before the Lord, whatever it is, don't let that sin block your worship of the Lord today. Because when we go out of here, we go out to worship. 
Here I am to worship. Going out to worship. Now's the time to worship. Don't let sin block your worship. Father, as we prepare our hearts now for a short time of prayer, I pray, God, that as your Holy Spirit does look into our heart, you'll take your word and convince us that you love sinners. And I'm so thankful that you love me and you love every person under the sound of my voice. And we do you the greatest service when we bring our sin to you and confess our sin and let you forgive us of our sin. We do ourselves well when we say, God, prepare my heart to worship you. Prepare my heart to be a shining example for you. God, now, as we continue to pray, I pray as you search our heart, we'll just let you convict us of sin, that we'll be willing to repent of our sin and turn away from our sin, and let the light of Jesus shine in us so the reflection of the light of Jesus can shine out of our life. In Jesus' name now, we continue to worship. 